Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, August 11th, 2013. Oh, <laughs> try as she might, Chelsea cannot lie her way out of labor. I know that she would love to. She knows that if she delivers this baby right now, then everyone is going to know that she's further along than she's pretended she is. But my question is, is it really that much of a difference? I mean, how m much are we talking here between the time that she last slept with Adam and the time that she slept with Dylan? She definitely procrastinated. She waited too long to decide to go ahead and bed Dylan to, ne to put this whole child into his life. But what are we talking, like a week, two weeks, a month tops? It could not have been any more than a month. So is it that atypical for a child to be born a month early? I don't know. I don't have any children, so I don't know. But at the beginning of the week, she's going into labor. She gets rushed into the hospital. She's lying there in the bed in total panic. The doctors are telling her, look, we can try to give you medication to stop the labor, but the child is going to come when the child is going to come. And she has this realization that her lie is about to catch up with her any moment now. I mean, they can maybe delay this labor a couple of days if they're lucky, but she's gonna have this baby. There's no way around it. And she begins to feel like her world is crashing in around her. The lie that she told is just crumbling and the truth is becoming revealed. And she feels so horrible, just like a ho the horrible person that she is right now. But then she looks up and she sees Dylan's sweet face there with her every step along the way, completely devoted, entirely attentive to her every need, and it further reinforces what a jerk she is to do this to such a sweet guy. And she wants to tell him the truth, and she has this moment, as she's had many, where she's saying, I, you know, I gotta, I wanna tell you, or she's intimating that she wants to fess up, and then Chloe shows up. Best friend of the year. Chloe should get an, uh, some kind of award for being such a great friend because she and because Chelsea and Chloe have this moment alone and Chelsea tells Chloe what she's feeling as she has many times and yet again Chloe's great advice to her, listen, the truth will ruin everything. You tell the truth, your whole world is going to get blown up. Wow! What, what an excellent friend. Like, what about the truth will set you free? That would be my advice. It's been Chloe who's been nudging Chelsea down this path the entire way. Chelsea would have done herself such a huge favor to just stop listening to Chloe. So many times along this path, I've wanted to just strangle Chelsea and say, stop listening to Chloe. She's the one that's that's causing you to, uh, to, to go ahead with this lie that you know isn't right and again like this has happened a million times Dylan walks in on Chelsea and Chloe having this conversation and yet again Chloe has to come up with some kind of excuse for what they were really talking about Chloe and Chelsea are constantly conspiring and Dylan's walking in on it and then they make up some kind of lie and everything just goes away and I I just think that Dylan has got to know on some level that he is being lied to. And I thought that there was this really telling line in that scene. I think it was after Chloe had left. I don't know, maybe she was already there. But it was this intimate moment between Dylan and Chelsea. And he just looks at her and he says, You have handed me everything that I've ever wanted. And I thought, hmm... I think that speaks a lot to where his mindset is. He wants this child no matter what. He wants this child so much that he's willing to ignore all of the signs and there are so many signs. So I'm asking myself, okay, wait a minute here. Is, isn't Dylan kind of complicit in this whole lie? For one thing, 
because he never insisted on a paternity test. He completely took Chelsea at her word. He trusted her immediately, and he never pursued any kind of truth. I think Dylan wants the baby so much that he doesn't, at this point, maybe even care if she's lying. I think the great twist would be Dylan knowing this whole time. Chelsea's doing everything she can to scramble around and keep the truth from him. I think the great twist would be if Dylan really knew that the child wasn't his, and it's gonna come out sooner or later. The baby is, like, on its way, and... I don't know, maybe this is me being weird or whatever, but in my head I kept thinking, well, maybe the fact that the baby is coming early is like the baby's way of wanting this lie to be exposed. Maybe the child knows on some uh, base level uh, that it, it, Dylan is not the father. Maybe this child wants its real father, wants Adam. I don't know, maybe that's me being crazy, but... <laughs> But it's the child, it's her child that is ultimately forcing Chelsea into this position where she may have to tell the truth or where one way or the other this lie might become exposed. So, Dylan, this poor fool, he goes out into the hall and he tries to talk to Chelsea's doctor, tries to get some information about what happens if the child is born early, is it going to be too premature, can you give me any, any thing here, and the doctor refuses to talk to him, talk with him about Chelsea's condition. The doctor knows that Chelsea's lying. Chelsea straight up blurted it out. You know, Dylan can't know that he's not the real father of this baby. So this doctor is now in a position where she has to keep her patient's secret. So she is real tight-lipped about what she can tell Dylan. And Dylan obviously found that to be strange, but he didn't pursue it. <laughs> and again, I think he doesn't really want to know the truth. He's perfectly happy with the lie just as much as Chelsea is. Except the fact that Chelsea is not entirely happy with the lie. It's weighing on her conscience. She is probably has some medication in her system, and she has this nightmare, yet another one of her nightmares, where Adam comes into the hospital, she wakes up, Adam's there, she wants to know where the baby is, and Adam says, oh, ha -ha, I've taken the child away, and you will not have the child, as if he's Victor Newman, and he's not. <laughs> and I, I just keep thinking in my heart, why is Chelsea so afraid of Adam? Because I feel like Adam loves Chelsea. He has done nothing but try to get back together with Chelsea for a very long time. And he's kind of, even at various points, given her opportunities to come clean. And I think Adam would have been perfectly happy, even though she lied to him, to move on and kind of have a family together. So I don't know why she's so afraid that Adam is going to have this evil reaction is just going to snatch her baby away from her. I thought, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's that she doesn't want to be with Adam and she's afraid that uh, one has to be the other. Like if she reveals that he's the father, then she will have to be with him. I don't know. But then again, I think Chelsea does still love Adam. So I don't entirely understand her um, her fear. And maybe it's just the fact that she's pregnant and th that's her maternal instinct. I don't know. Maybe she's just um, irrationally afraid. But she also has this added layer of knowing that if the truth comes out, Dylan, who has become her greatest supporter, uh, her confidant, this person who she's leaned on during a very difficult time in her life, a person that she's grown to love, once this truth comes out, he's going to hate her. He's not going to want to have anything to do with her. So the fear kicks in that Dylan finds out is furious, and now their whole life that they've been dreaming of is going to be crushed to pieces. And when she wakes up, she finds out that that's not exactly the case, because despite Chelsea's reservations, despite the fact that Dylan has got to know that something is up, that Chelsea's hiding something from him. He comes back into the uh, hospital room and he proposes to her. He says, you know, we need, let's, let's get married now. 
let's just throw caution to the wind and just get married right now. I Again, I just think that they're both totally complicit in this. And Chelsea is right there pushing her along, pushing her along, telling Chelsea that, you know, if uh, she if, if she were to tell the truth, then she's never going to see her baby again. What a horrible thing to say. If you tell the truth, you're never going to see your baby again. I don't think that's true. Do you think that's true? I, I feel like the stakes are artificially raised here. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But Adam is definitely lurking around the scene. He, I think, knows in the back of his mind that she could be pulling a fast one. He knows what her past is. And he um, actually, while going through this whole rape charge realizes that he needs someone to testify to his character. He's going to be going to trial and he needs someone on his side who can speak to the fact that he's not this horrible monster rapist. So this is, of course, at Leslie's advising. He chooses, all on his own, to go to find Chelsea and ask her if she can be the one to testify on his behalf. Well, why not pick, like, Jack or somebody? Why Chelsea? Why would you pick your ex-wife. I think Adam is grasping at straws as, at ways to have connections with her. How awkward would it be to have your ex-wife testify on your behalf at your rape trial? I don't know. I think that's putting her in a really terrible position, and I'm surprised he doesn't have many, many, many other colleagues and things that could speak at least to his character, if that's what the point is. I don't know, maybe it's because Chelsea's a woman. Maybe, I don't know, he doesn't know any other women that could help him? No, he wants a connection with Chelsea, so he goes to the loft, uh, or the warehouse, wherever it is, the horrible place that they're living, and Dylan is there, and Adam wants to know where Chelsea is, and he asks about her, and Dylan has to confess that she was having some contractions and that she's in the hospital, and Adam even remarked, oh, that's kind of early. Yeah, the, every, I feel like everybody in this situation just knows what's up. <laughs> they just know what's up, and they're just not doing anything about it. So Dylan tells Adam to stay away from Chelsea, and Adam is kind of just reverted to sort of being weak in this scenario. He sort of accepts that he lost his chance with her, I suppose, and he moves on. Dylan goes back to the hospital. Chelsea is released from the hospital, and they come back home together to the warehouse where Dylan has arranged a surprise marriage. <laughs> surprise! We're getting married today. He's got balloons all over the place. Ugh, nightmare wedding with balloons? No. No balloons at my wedding, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a snob, I guess. But Dylan arranges for the family and friends to show up, and he surprises her. Let's see, Anita and Jeff are there, Stitch is there, Chloe's there, and it's just supposed to be this surprise, happy occasion. And I thought it was funny. I honestly thought some of the highlights were when Anita was kind of flirting with Stitch. <laughs> Anita saw big, beefy Stitch standing in the corner, and he had said something complimentary to her, just, you know, being a gentleman. And Anita was like, well, well, well. I mean, she was practically pinching his buns in the corner. <laughs> I absolutely loved that. I loved Jeff's snarky remarks. Jeff is just a joy to watch lately. You know, I that reminds me, I feel like Jeff and Anita are constantly together every time we see them. Okay, so Jeff and Anita are married? They're married, right? Jeff was married to Gloria, but that turned out to be invalid because he was still married to Anita. So they're married. Are they in a relationship together? I, I feel befuddled by the Jeff and Anita relationship. But surprisingly, I've been enjoying even Anita. I used to could not stand her, and I don't love her. But still, at the same time, I don't hate her as much as I used to. What is that? Now, if only I could feel that, begin to feel that way about Chelsea. I guess I do on some level because... Um, Chelsea 
is looking at Dylan, realizing that he's, you know, created the surprise for her. She's about to marry him. She's about to commit herself to him. And she did have a, a kind of a sweet moment where she was kind of looking across the room at him and he was looking back at her. And I think Chelsea ha allowed herself to become swept up in the moment, in, in the passion of the moment. And she had, you know, I don't know, I, I think she had begun to let herself believe that she deserved the man of her dreams and she deserved this life that Dylan was promising her and she did have this very sweet moment this sort of sweet look in her face as she's accepting the lie as the truth and everything on her face said that she was happy and the wedding ensues, she does her little walk down the aisle, and they say their vows, and it's very touching and very clear that these are two people that do have genuine feelings for each other, <clears throat> based on a lie, but they do care about one another, and he gives Chelsea her his mother's ring. I think the rings that they used were his parents' rings. So Dylan is also, I think, maybe sort of idealizing his parents that have passed in their marriage, and they had this really great marriage, and Dylan had all of these ideas for what his life would be life with, like with Avery, and now perhaps he's projecting that on onto Chelsea. Chelsea is certainly projecting some things onto him, although I do believe that they do genuinely care about each other, and it was a touching ceremony. And um, so they're married. <laughs> and as soon as everybody left, Chelsea's sitting on the couch, and she's starting to have pangs, and finally the big pang happens, and she realizes she's going into labor. There is no stopping it. She doesn't even have time to make it to the hospital. I don't know if Dylan's going to end up delivering the baby or what, but... Sorry, Chelsea, as much as you don't like it, you cannot run from your lie anymore. Billy's plan to frame Adam for sexual harassment has quickly gotten away from him. I think Billy thought that he could control Melanie, but he can't. And sexual harassment is one thing, but Melanie has taken it to a whole nother level by accusing Adam of rape. And Billy realizes this. Billy realizes that it wasn't too long ago when he was falsely accused of rape. And it's not pretty, and it's not right. So Billy, having been through that firsthand, makes him, I think, try to get Melanie to back off a little bit. You know, this is taking it way farther than I think Billy intended, but Melanie is vengeful. This woman wants Adam to go down, and she said this cryptic line to Billy as he's trying to convince her to back off. She says something to the effect of, you know, this rape charge is just a piece of the larger puzzle. So Melanie has some kind of grand plan that goes beyond what's happening right now. Adam is arrested. Adam is like in the jail. Paul has arrested him. And I know that there are some very happy fans out there to see that Leslie is representing him. Patricia, I'm looking at you. I know. And, and Michael, I think a lot of people are really hoping that a relationship develops between Leslie and Adam. And I'm see it. I mean, I'm definitely on board. We'll see where it goes. Let's test those waters. But for the meantime, Paul has required Adam to give a DNA sample. I mean, I guess Paul needs to match Adam's DNA sample with the clothes or whatever it is that Melanie provided to him. Uh, yuck. And so <laughs> that Paul requires Adam to give this DNA sample, but wait a minute, like, Adam admitted that he slept with her. They slept together. I don't think anyone is going to deny that. I don't even think Melanie would deny that. Melanie seems to have admitted that they did sleep together at one time, but her story is that this particular time, Adam said, you know, would not take no for an answer. But there are tons of witnesses that put them together. So 
Uh, frankly, it to me just seems like his word against hers. I don't know how this charges would even ever stick. Leslie was able to get Adam out on bail, and the first thing he does is go to on the boulevard where Melanie happens to be, and he confronts her. And Adam goes on this diatribe about how, you know, he, you know, what do you want, Melanie? Is it, is it uh, money that you want? What's it gonna take? One million, two million? What's it gonna take for you to, you know, make this go away? And Melanie just looks at him and says, you know, I'm, I'm not out for money. There's no amount of money you could offer me. So it's pretty clear at this point that Melanie's out for revenge. Money has nothing to do with it. Now, big twisty shocker, Billy shows up at, right after Melanie storms off and reveals to Adam that that whole conversation they just had, yeah, Billy's got it on tape. Billy was recording the whole thing, essentially making it look like Adam was bribing a, a witness in his own rape trial. Now, my first thought was, Adam, you should have known better. How is it that you did not see this coming? Like, Billy bested Adam? I, I, I'm shocked by that. I, I always expect Adam to come out on top. And then he goes and makes this stupid mistake of confronting um, Melanie and, and bribing her for crying out loud. I mean, that's what he was doing. He was. He was trying to, to find out what she wanted in order to get her to go away. And that was such a dumb move. I'm sure Leslie would have had to have, for crying out loud, uh, advised him against that, right? I can't believe he did that. I just can't believe it. So, Billy is dangling this little piece of evidence in front of Adam's face, and Adam's not happy about it, and it's become very heated. And then, Victoria walks in, and she kind of, you know, asks what's going on between these two guys, and Adam said nothing. He just kind of walked away, he just kind of quipped and walked away. Why didn't Adam bust Billy out in that moment? Now, Billy's blackmailing him. Why didn't Adam take the opportunity to tell Victoria exactly what was going on and try to get Billy back? I, I don't know. Maybe he thought then for sure that tape would get out. I don't know. I think that right there, the fact that Adam said nothing shows that Billy's blackmail is is working. Adam kind of had to put his tail between his legs and walk off and, and take it. He sort of had to take that punch from Billy, which was unexpected, uh, by me at least, but um, in general I think that Adam is taking this all very, very well. <laughs> He's been accused of rape, then blackmail. Now the press is chasing him down everywhere he goes, in his condo, out to restaurants, they're calling him on the phone, they're like beating on his door outside of his house for crying out loud, and to boot, Victor is breathing down his neck. Victor is hearing about all of this, about the, the his co-partner in Newman Enterprises, a, a huge company, and these rape charges. Victor's trying to get a hold of him. He's ticked off that Adam is just blatantly ignoring his phone calls, and rightfully so. So Victor shows up at the condo where Adam is kind of having a conference, or you know, he's talking with Leslie about his case, and he asks what the heck is going on. Leslie tries to be the um, the mediator a little bit in the scene, and she is just focused on trying to get Adam out of these charges, and she asks Victor if he would be willing to stand by his son and, you know, cooperate that, that uh, Melanie was playing both of these two guys. If, if Victor would just come clean and talk about how Melanie was involved in this spy thing between the two of them, Leslie could prove that she's vengeful, and Victor refuses. He refuses to cooperate to help Adam. He doesn't want to blow his own, you know, his, his, he doesn't want to admit that he was actually involved in this act, so he's going to let his son go down on a rape charge? Horrible! Horrible! Adam took a bullet for you, Victor, for crying out loud! You can't tell a little truth to help him out of this rape charge? It's ridiculous! So, after
after Leslie leaves, Adam and Victor sit down on the couch. They have this moment together. Victor is acting all high and mighty as if he's never been involved in a scandal before. And Adam brings that up. He says, you know, what about the Leanna Love? What about that whole expose? And then he brings up the fact that Trisha Dennison, way back in the day, accused Victor of rape. And that turned out to be false, that she was lying. She was setting him up. It's a very similar situation. My head just about exploded when that happened because I was just thinking about Trisha Dennison out of, out of almost nowhere. I don't know if you guys were watching the show back then, but Trisha Dennison was this crazy, like, oh, she had like this awesome 90s hairspray hair and all of these awesome 90s outfits. She was just this vixen who ended up shooting and killing Ryan McNeil and trying to say, claim that Victor had raped her. I was just thinking about this. Before any of this came up on the show, I posted a, a, a message in the forums at yrchat.com on my website to, just talking about Trisha Dennison and kind of about her story and then all of a sudden out of nowhere it comes up. I don't know if I like subconsciously made that connection or what, but if you weren't watching the show back then or if you're just kind of interested in, in reliving that little tale, go to the website at yrchat.com, go into the forums, the flashback section, there is a post all about Trisha Dennison. You gotta, you gotta read it because the girl was crazy. <laughs> And it was so good to just hear that name again. I just love YNR history, so that was a treat. But I'm sure Adam was probably furiously searching the internet for some kind of precedent because Victor is blowing up his phone. Adam knows that Victor is going to just swoop down on him, so Adam's probably like Googling Victor Newman to try to find some kind of scandal that he can compare it to so that he can have something to come back at Victor with because Victor would have Adam's head on a stick if he could, but Victor can't fire Adam. That's the whole thing. They're co-owners in this company. So there's really nothing Victor can do to get Adam out. So now they just have to deal with the repercussions of all of this, which by the way, Victor was the one that set it all into action. If Victor hadn't started the bribing thing with Melanie, none of this ever would have happened. Yet again, Victor is the one that lights the fuse and Everybody else ends up having to pay for it, but Victor refuses to take any responsibility. Now, they've got this reporter up their asses constantly. There's this reporter that's following them around everywhere, asking questions. She's calling for Adam to step down from Newman Enterprises. What a big surprise. Guilty until proven innocent. That's exactly how it works in this country anyway. So Adam is assumed to be guilty just because he's been accused. And they're at um, on the boulevard, and this reporter is hounding them, and Billy has to come up and get involved, and he has to throw his two cents in there and and get down on Adam. I, I don't even know why Billy doesn't feel at least a little bit of guilt, but he has to throw gas on the fire. Tell Adam, by the way, that Chelsea is getting married right at this very moment, you know, because Billy was the one that delivered the cake to Chelsea's wedding, yeah, Billy, remember, like, what was it, two years ago when Chelsea was accusing you of rape and now you're delivering her wedding cake? Yeah, okay, that all worked out for you. But Billy, make sure, even after Adam leaves, to have this private little moment with Victor to rub that recording right in Victor's face because he has this recording of Adam trying to bribe a witness. So Victor obviously is not wanting to give Billy any cred whatsoever. Like, what, you think this is going to help you? get back in with Victoria and that's my exact same thought like what is it that Billy wants out of all of this does he want Victoria to go back to Newman Enterprises because separately Victoria's just pining for Newman Enterprises oh, oh Adam's just screwing up the company so bad and I could do so much of a better job even though I've been given so many opportunities and I've never been able to make it work if Victoria really wanted to be at Newman Enterprises she could have stayed at, at Newman Enterprises so apparently Billy thinks that this is going to ingratiate him with his wife and that uh, by by all of this crap with Adam by by framing and blackmailing Adam that's going to help him get his wife and his life back on a platter? 
I got a real a good voicemail this week, again, from Gary. I love you, Gary. You know I do. Um, and he made an excellent point about <laughs> Billy and Victoria's relationship. Victoria is so hard on Billy. And in real life, Billy would probably be out having an affair with Chloe or somebody else to try to make him feel good about himself because his wife does not make him feel good about himself. Victoria treats him like a child every single time she's in a, you know, she comes in to see him. I mean, I, I totally understand that Victoria is sick of Billy's crap, but she doesn't treat him like an equal. She treats him like a dog that she's got on a leash. And I had a poll up last week on the website at yrchat.com. Should Billy and Victoria stay together? And it seemed like it was kind of a 60-40 split. 60% of you guys thought, nope, Billy and Victoria, let's get it over with. But then 40% were like, yes, they need to work it out. And I feel like, gosh, break up or stay together, how about starting out with a little bit of honesty? Because whether I liked my stepbrother, Adam, or not, I would never stand for my husband setting him up for sexual harassment at the least. Oh, YNR, you're killing me with this hypnosis thing. <laughs> Neil goes into a hypnotist to get hypnotized to remember what happened with Rose. First of all, why couldn't the doctor that have been doing it be Sharon's doctor? That lady had some personality. I think she could be a really good match for Neil. I don't know. I just thought she was kind of cool. But instead, we just got this sort of weirdo, hippie <laughs> vibe sort of um, hypnotist. And Neil goes under and... <laughs> He begins the process of remembering, and it's pretty much all the same information we already knew, what happened at the bar, until then we get to a hotel. Apparently, Rose and Neil want to get a hotel together. And I just, by the way, on, on a separate note, I think Rose was like coming on to Neil kind of hardcore, which to me makes me think, is this kind of a setup or something? Was she trying to set him up? I don't know. But they get to this hotel room, Neil is remembering, and they're totally drunk. Neil is laughing his full head off about everything. Everything is hilarious to Neil when he's drunk. And he gets this phone call from Lily, which he ignores. And something about that moment, Neil started to get really, really agitated. The hypnotist brings him out of it, just as we were getting somewhere, Lily calling, I'm like, dang. But then Neil freaks out. He feels guilty for having... Uh, ignored Lily's phone call, but the hypnotist decides to, you know, bring him back down, and Neil starts to remember again. He's in the hotel room. Rose seems to want to have sex, <laughs> but Neil... Um, he seems like he's not interested in it. His wife just died. And I think that's part of his guilt is he's hoping he wasn't going to have sex with this random woman after his wife just died. But next thing you know, Rose is passed out on the bed. And Neil's kind of just nudging her a little bit like, hey, Rose, are you awake? And she's not responding at all. But Neil just assumes she's passed out because they were so drunk. So he just kind of leaves. He just, he, he dips. He's like, I'm out, you know. <laughs> I got other places to be. She'll sleep it off. Then... He comes up out of, out of the hypnosis, he goes back, tells Leslie everything about what just happened, and he is feeling good! It's like a moment where he's like, oh, I just I feel good, you know, I was afraid I did something to Rose, but now I realize I just left her there. I feel so refreshed. It was such an interesting experience, you know, I remember everything. I remember little details, even the calendar on the wall that said what date it was. It was April 16th or something like that. And then, no, wait, no, April 14th, I think it was. And uh, this rings a bell with Leslie, and she says, well, Rose died on the April 15th. So Neil realizes <laughs> that Rose wasn't passed out. She was dead. He was with her the night that she died. And so he basically, I guess, left her for dead? I don't know. That's pretty bad, but he didn't know any better. Now, 
I got a really good email this week from a YNR chat fan, uh, Sue Ellen, and she like outlined her theory about what she thinks is going on with this whole situation. I've been lost on this whole storyline for so long, and I have to say this is a pretty good freaking theory. It's it's long, but I got it. Bear with me because it's good, and this could be very correct. So I'm just going to read to you exactly what she thinks. So this is her theory of what happened. <laughs> Gus and Belinda have Leslie, okay? Rose and Wheeler have a daughter named Anne from an affair, and Wheeler mistreats Rose. So the infamous Anne is actually uh, Rose's daughter with Wheeler. Now, separately, Belinda, Leslie's mom, works for Wheeler and cheats with him. Now, it's kind of a side note, um, Sue Ellen says she believes Tyler is really Wheeler's son, and that's the big reveal in all of this that will send poor Tyler running back into Lily's arms. Now, Gus becomes abusive and bitter about Wheeler, Wheeler and Belinda's affair. To preserve his political career and keep this from coming out, Wheeler kills Belinda, or has her killed, and frames Gus. That totally makes sense. We pretty much know all of that. After this, Gus and Rose become friends with a common bond against Wheeler. Remember, Gus says he never cheated on Belinda, so that's what the secret bond was. It wasn't a sexual relationship. Now, Gus and Rose seek a retrial for Gus while he's in prison. Six years ago, Avery takes the case and Wheeler panics. Wheeler has Rose followed and her purse stolen from the bar so as to switch her meds so that she will die if she has any alcohol. Wheeler knows that Rose has a problem with alcohol. That has to play in. That purse snatching has to play in somewhere, right? I mean, I think that's a pretty, that's a pretty solid theory. Okay, let me keep going. This is where it's going to blow your mind. The redhead Melanie is the daughter who Rose refers to as Anne maybe named after or by Wheeler's wife, Anne, if Rose lost custody? That's, that's where it gets interesting to me. Anne is sent away by, Wheeler's, by Wheeler after Rose's death and is now being used by Wheeler to exact revenge with her new identity as Melanie Daniels. Pew, head blown! I think that makes total sense because it doesn't really make sense that, like, would Hillary really be Anne's daughter? Would Hillary really? I don't know. I, how could she be Neil's daughter? That doesn't really... They didn't have sex. So if Rose and Neil didn't have sex, then that means Hillary's not his daughter, which means that's not Hillary... That's, that, that's not Hillary's revenge getting back at Neil. So I'm going to keep going here. Melanie is the original blogger who's angry with Neil all of these years from leaving her mother dead in a hotel and with Adam for leaving her half-sister dead in an alley. Uh-huh, and for disposing of her body. However, Melanie sort of liked Adam, sort of enjoyed the sex, and took his ultimate rejection quite badly. Despite her thirst for revenge, she would have settled for a relationship with a billionaire. Well, wouldn't we all? <laughs> Now, Melanie is being super manipulated by Wheeler, who's in prison, by the way, since he's the one responsible for the deaths of Belinda and Rose. Hillary has decided to capitalize off the blogger scandal to get closer to Kane simply because she likes him and sees that she might have an opportunity because of Lily's feelings for Tyler. Uh, Sue Ellen says she believes that Hillary is a red herring and not the offspring of any of these people. As for Neil, wrong place, wrong time. That is a heck of a theory. Holy cow, like Sue Ellen, you might be totally right about it all. I mean, it's actually, it's so twisty and so good and juicy, it's probably not the case. <laughs> I don't know if YNR is as good of writers as you are. Hillary is doing a real good job of playing the victim role. This blogger is insinuating that something's going on between she and Kane. And Lily is now feeling so guilty for roping this poor girl into her family mess. And Hillary is just trying so hard to, to play like she's the innocent. And she even says like to, to, to Kane and Lily, or I think she says to Kane, uh, you don't think I'm trying to seduce you? Oh no, of course 
it's not. <laughs> and Lily is totally secure in her marriage. Things couldn't be better or more solid between Kane and Lily. They're better than they've ever been, right? Well, Lily finds out this week that Tyler and Abby are totally together and Lily is totally jealous. And Noah is weirded out by it too, by the way. Abby wakes up in the apartment that he shares with Tyler and she's like getting coffee and he's like, okay, this is a little weirder than I would like to be. I don't really want to see my cousin and, and like post you know, like, I don't know, in Tyler's shirt, like, after just having sex, it's just too weird for Noah. And then and, uh, Tyler goes out to the coffee house to get some post-sex pastries to bring home to uh, Abby, where Lily runs into him, and Lily knows all about post-sex pastries. She sees right away exactly what must have happened between Tyler and Abby, and she tries to play it off, acts like it's fine, but it's clearly a tense situation between them. And Hillary happens to see it all. Hillary's always in the background lurking. But, you know, in, in kind of in lieu of this theory of Sue Ellen's that we just talked about, Hillary really has never shown any malice toward Neil. All of Hillary's intentions seems to be toward Lily and Kane. The only thing Hillary's really ever shown us is that she wants Kane. <laughs> and she, she probably is going to be there to uh, p p push Lily and Tyler together as much as possible and to make herself seem like she's just the innocent bystander and Kane will just fall right into her arms. I mean... Uh, Hillary even introduced herself to Devon this week, um, just like a member of the family, wants to be on Devon's good side, and she's all chummy with him. And side note, Devon offers Tyler his old job back at Jabot, and Tyler declines. I thought that was interesting. I, uh, Tyler's trying to move on. It's Lily who the, is the one that's stuck. She seems to be the one that can't move on. And Hillary sees clear as day that there's a crack in that relationship of Lily and Kane's. So Kane is at home sick. <laughs> so Hillary decides to bring him a little carton of chicken soup and oops, oops, he tries to open the top off and he spills it all over his shirt. Oh no, he has to take off the shirt so quick because it's it's hot. He has to whip it right off and he's standing there and she gets a good look at his chest. <laughs> Why in our is becoming a professional at giving us the candid shirtless dude <laughs> moment. Like, the same thing happened last week with Tyler. Abby and Lily come into his apartment and he's standing there all shirtless like, oh, just candid, like, oh, well, I'm just, I happen to be shirtless. And then, at another point in the week, uh, Sharon walks in on Nick, happens to be shirtless, and then Kane is happening to be shirtless. Everyone's happening to be shirtless. How come anyone can ever happen to be pantsless? <laughs> Why couldn't Kane have spilled chicken soup on his pants instead? <laughs> you notice that? It's like, why, why do we always, we always get to the guys, you know, we get their, their chests, but how come we can't see them in, like, some little underwear or, like, little shorts or something or in the buff? Like, imagine, like, why can't Adam be sunbathing on the roof nude <laughs> of his, like, sunbathing on the roof of his giant condo skyscraper nude and then just tastefully maybe like a copy of a financial journal over his junk so it's not too revealing for daytime. I mean, I'm not saying I want to watch the, these people in porn or something, but like, why can't it be just a little more uh, tantalizing? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. I'm bad. But anyway, Jill walks in on this scenario of Kane shirtless and Hillary there. And Jill's reaction is just, what the hell? What the hell's going on here? And I'm sure Jill is reading the blog post and then she sees exactly what Hillary is doing. Jill seems to be the only one who sees through what Hillary is doing. I, I mean, everybody wants something. And Jill knows that Hillary doesn't want money. Jill already offered Hillary money, and Hillary didn't take it. So what's Hillary's motivation? It's clearly that she wants Kane. So Jill, straight up, at a, separately, Hillary goes back to the coffee house, and Jill finds her and confronts her and tells her to stay the hell away from Kane. Now, 
oh, on a slight tangent, I, I, we're, we're getting, we're getting toward, uh, Catherine's demise. Jill mentions to Kane, she's having kind of a heart to heart with him, and she mentions that Catherine and Murphy are away on vacation. And then Kane gets a postcard from Catherine, and it was such a sweet postcard, and she's, I think they said she was in Machu Picchu, and she's talking, and she's writing in this postcard about how much fun she's having, and you haven't lived until you've had a close encounter with a llama, she says. Just sweet. I can almost hear her saying it. It's going to be really hard, and I heard, I don't remember who told me this, and I'm sorry, if you don't want to, I don't even know, it's just a rumor, I don't know if it's a spoiler or not, so plug your ears if you don't want to hear it, but I'm sorry, I don't remember who told me this, but someone said that Catherine and Murphy are going to perish in a, a plane accident, that like, we're going to hear that their plane went down. I don't, uh, uh, I, I just, it's hard, I, I, I just know Catherine's going to die and this funeral is going to happen and on one level I'm looking forward to it because there'll be closure and there'll be a lot of familiar faces but on another level I just feel like I am not ready for this. Noah calls Sharon out about her meds. Why are you lying? He says. He seems to be the only one that's really <clears throat> a seeing through Sharon at this point. Noah goes to Nick and tells him that he's concerned about Sharon, that she's acting irrationally, that there's something off about her. Sharon knows it's about to happen, and she has this scene where she's rationalizing it with Ghost Cassie, saying, well... Maybe it's a good thing if, if Noah goes to Nick. I mean, ultimately, Sharon wants Nick to ride in and rescue her the way that he always has, and it worked. Noah goes to Nick, and Nick goes right to Sharon. He shows up, and she acts all surprised. Oh, well, I had no idea you would be coming here, Nick. Of course, I'm fine. I'm fine. I mean, she denies everything. Meanwhile, her intentions are becoming crystal clear to pretty much everyone around her. She shows up at Nick's house the next day, and she She's having a family breakfast with he and Faith, and I think Nick is eating it up because he misses the daughter that he's lost. So the, you know he he's probably got some extra attention to want to put on to Faith. So they're making pancakes when Nikki shows up, and she just blasts Sharon right in front of Nick. Like, well, my son's fiance is out of town for five minutes, and you're over here making pancakes. What are you doing? I mean, in reality, they share a child together. There's no reason why Sharon ha you know, would not be there. But uh, Nikki just knows that Sharon is up to something. And Nikki has a lot of reasons to be suspicious of Sharon. Sharon burned down her house for crying out loud. So... I just thought that was a really funny moment, funny scene. I always seem to enjoy the Nikki and Sharon feud, so it was funny. I, I, I like that Nikki is alerted to what is going on with Sharon, uh, and maybe, who knows, maybe she'll put the smack down a little bit. <laughs> that could be fun. Now, Sharon is really trying to foster this family feeling with her, Nick, and Faith, and she wants everybody else to go out. She's she's playing games and just trying to have family fun time. She wants to shut everyone else out, but Summer stops by to see Faith, and it's so hard to believe that, like, Sharon can just sit there comfortably while Nick and Summer are just hurting, just absolutely in pain over the loss of their relationship. How can Sharon sit there knowing what she's done? How can she live with her herself? I mean, messing around with not only Nick and Summer's life, but her own daughter's life as well. She sees how close that Summer and Faith are. She's taking a sister away from her own daughter. It's just wrong. And 
By the way, Nick, Sharon is always there to try to act like she's Nick's best friend. She's Nick's advocate. She she wants to be there for him. She wants to be the voice of reason <laughs> for him. <laughs> As if Sharon is the voice of reason for anyone. And she encourages Nick to step away from Summer. She sees that he's hurting. She tells him, let her go to Jack. You need to let her go. How could she do that? It's shocking. It's absolutely shocking to me. And there was this cute little scene where Summer is playing with Faith and they're all dressed up like fairy princesses and Nick and Sharon are sort of playing along. And it's heartbreaking because I like Nick and Sharon. I would have been totally for a Nick and Sharon reunion. And I think that they're very good with Faith when they want to be. They're very cute together. And it's just, it was a co almost cozy little scene if you didn't know that there's this grungy, underlying, horrible lie underneath of it all. And they're playing fairy princesses, and Faith wants to have some lipstick, so Sharon pulls out a tube of lipstick from her purse, and it is the infamous Creamy Nude. Creamy Nude strikes again. Sharon lost that one tube, so she must have rushed out to get another. Or who knows, maybe she has a stash. It is one of Jabot's most most popular colors. So, <laughs> Summer looks at the lipstick, notices that that's the same lipstick that Phyllis had, only, I mean, it's so far-fetched for crying out loud. This connection is so far-fetched. Summer explains the whole thing about, no, my mom had everlasting apricots. She could not possibly have had another lipstick in her bag. I mean, it's just, that's so stupid. It's so stupid. And Sharon tries to explain it all away, but Nick actually latched onto it right away. He said, well, I guess that could be, it could just be a coincidence, or that could mean also that someone else was there in the stairwell with Phil with Phyllis. But Sharon is like, no, I mean, that, that, that lipstick could have been there for weeks and weeks. She just plays it off, and it does seem to work. It kind of goes away for now, but Summer's got that little nugget in the back of her head. I don't know, maybe she'll tell Noah and Noah will be the one to put it together. Nikki and Victor showed back up this week and I got a voicemail from Michael who referred to seeing Nikki and Victor this week as the cameo of Nikki and Victor. And that is really how it felt. Um, Nikki and Victor no longer feel like uh, major players on the show. It does feel like they're just making appearances at this point. And I really did have to, I had to roll my eyes a little bit at the opening of that scene at the ranch where they're going to have a little family get together. Lem <laughs> Nikki picks up this jar of lemonade. She's going to pour some lemonade and the jug is shaking. I I really rolled my eyes at that scene. It felt so lame and tacked on. It felt like the writers were going, oh, don't worry, we didn't forget that Nikki has MS. Oh, don't worry, because she's shaking. Here, just, I I would be, I felt embarrassed. I guess that's the best way to put it, is I felt embarrassed by that scene. If I had, <laughs> if I had told somebody to watch YNR for the first time when that scene aired, I would be like, uh, yeah, that's not really representative of the show. I mean, it was so tacked on, just the shaking of the lemonade jar, whatever. I mean, I know I shouldn't go on about it, but it, it was notable in its um, cheesiness, I, I thought. I mean, yes, Nikki has MS. Is there no, if you chose to go down the line of Nikki ha having MS, why don't you follow it all the way through? Don't just throw it in just with a peppering. It, it felt like it was placating or something, but anyway. <laughs> Nikki and Victor have decided to have this small little family gathering where basically only Summer and Nick were invited and Summer suspects that this is mainly a you're still a part of the family pity party and she's right that's exactly what it was uh, Summer comes in and you know Victor's got his whole spiel that he's saying for Victor this whole situation of Summer and the paternity is all about territory, not about family. It's about Victor wanting to mark his territory. And he couldn't help himself uh, from saying something like, of course, you're still a Newman. Of course you're still a Newman. Like, it's being charitable. Like, don't worry, you may be an abbot, but we still accept you, little beggar child. Like, I think Victor just doesn't like to lose. 
And especially not to Jack. He can't stand the fact that his granddaughter is actually Jack's daughter. It just turns his stomach. And Summer doesn't want to be caught up in the middle of that. And I don't blame her. Summer is struggling right now. She does not know where she fits in the family, in her world, in her life. She's trying to distance herself from everyone. And all of a sudden, uh, Courtney becomes this good friend. She's been, you know, was pushing Summer into sexuality before Summer was really ready to become sexual. And now all of a sudden, Courtney's this good friend and she calls Noah to alert Summer, that, or sorry, calls Noah to alert him that Summer is kind of down and she needs some help. When really, frankly, I think Courtney is just trying to find ways to get close to Noah. YNR seemed that they were testing that relationship a little bit, Courtney and Noah. Um, um, and I, I don't know, I'm not feeling it. I just, I can't, I don't feel Courtney at all. One little iota. Um, but anyway, Noah comes over and he tries to convince Summer to stop fighting her feelings, to stop forcing herself to say that she hates Nick or that she doesn't, you know, she, or that the feelings that she has for Nick have suddenly disappeared. And he successfully convinces Summer to go to Nick. And so she shows up up at the tack house and she looks in through the window and sees Nick having this little moment with Faith and I think Summer felt really empty like you know like that used to be me with my daddy and now I don't have my daddy anymore I have this guy that I don't really know I don't even have my mother anymore and so she just turns around and leaves and it was really heartbreaking knowing that they are actually father and daughter and they're being held apart by Sharon how can Sharon even sleep at night Avery has hinted in a couple of ways this week that she wants answers about what happened to Phyllis. She is not content to just let it go, that it was just an accident. Avery seems convinced that there's more to it, and maybe Summer will tell Avery about the creamy nude, and Avery will be the one to blow it all up, because Avery is already suspicious of Sharon. She sees that Sharon is trying to move in on Nick, so maybe Avery can shake the truth, out of Sharon, show us that she is actually Phyllis's sister, and start kind of getting getting a little wild. I mean, I'd be interested in that. I'm definitely interested to see Avery versus Sharon. Now, by the way, Avery and Jack went to Georgia to get Phyllis settled in her facility. I'm sorry, I had to laugh a little bit when they called back home. I can't remember who they said this to, but mentioned, I think it was Summer, mentioned that Phyllis has like an ocean view room. She's a coma patient. <laughs> what difference does that make? Who, what coma, what? What kind of facility is this where all of the coma patients have ocean views. All right, okay. <laughs> I'll just go along with that. But uh, Avery <clears throat> mentioned, and I, actually I think a couple people mentioned, that the doctors are kind of um, uh, bringing up and uh, bragging about another coma patient that had similar situation to Phyllis's came out of the coma recently. So there's some hope that, co that Phyllis will come out of the coma. I, th I wonder if they're going to recast her. I just wonder because it just it seems as though all of the talk of Phyllis is when she gets better and I don't know I wonder if there is a plan to, to, to bring her back. Now <clears throat> Avery and Jack are becoming close. They're bonding over the over what has happened to Phyllis, and Jack is sharing his stories about Phyllis. Avery's sharing her stories, and gosh, I just thought, hmm, do you think that there's any possibility of Avery and Jack hooking up? And if so, what would you think of that, Avery and Jack? Leave me a comment. Let me know if you think there's any potential there. I don't know what it is about Jack, but 
boy, he's really won me this week. I have definitely gone through some periods of feeling like, all right, Jack's just sort of there. He's not necessarily grabbing me one way or the other. But lately he just is. And there was this brief moment where Avery takes a picture with her phone of Jack because she wants to print it out and put it next to, next to Phyllis's bed so that when Phyllis wakes up, when Phyllis wakes up, the first thing she'll see is Jack's face. And Avery takes this photo of Jack and Jack just stands there looking all dapper. And I just thought, well, something about that just made me think, I think I have a crush on Jack. <laughs> He just looked really good in that moment. And I never thought Jack was particularly good, like, a sexy. I never thought he was good looking, but he's a good looking man and he's got a good personality. I like how sensitive and he is. And gosh, if they've done, if Lionheart's done anything right in this whole, I mean, for crying out loud, in the last month, it has got to be Jack's character because I love him so much. Now, anyway, Kyle is also catching wind of everything that's going on in the summer. They had their big goodbye, we're gonna never see each other again, but Kyle and Summer see each other all the time, and Kyle's growing concerned about Summer, so Kyle flies all the way out to Georgia <laughs> to find Jack, to tell Jack that he needs to go home and spend some time <laughs> with Summer, which is true and that's great and all, but uh, for crying out loud, Kyle, you big dummy, a phone call would have been way easier to accomplish that. Well, there wasn't much follow-up about Fenn and Carmine and Lauren and Michael this week. Only a couple of brief scenes showing that Fenn is actually facing jail time for stealing those drugs. And uh, I think they're trying to work on getting him a deal where he can go to rehab instead of going to jail. He needed to go to rehab anyway! I've been saying that for weeks. Why don't they listen to me? <laughs> And, I mean, it really wasn't touched on very much, the whole thing. Uh, but there was a, a really, finally, good moment where Fenn confesses that Carmine didn't give him the drugs in the first place. This is all Fenn's doing. He's the one that got hooked. You can't blame this on Carmine. You can blame quite a bit on him, but not this. So I thought that was interesting. And then it really wasn't touched on for the rest of the week. So that's really all I have to say about that. I want to talk a little bit about a, a, a behind-the-scenes shake-up at YNR. Total rumor. I don't know if any of this is true, but um, I read an article this past uh, week that Josh Griffith, the head writer at YNR, may be out. Now, the article's really good, and I referred to it and posted it at yrchat.com. If you go to my website there, go into the forums, go to the behind the scenes section, there is a, a repost of the article. You gotta read it, because it's kinda juicy. It sounds like Jill Farron Phelps, the head executive producer is not happy with the with the writing not happy with him sounds like Josh Griffith is not really happy there either he's getting ready to be toward the end of his contract so he may be out um, and in fact it just sort of seems like everybody kind of knows that YNR is maybe not in the best place it could be right now that the article which you got to read it so go to yrchat.com and find it because it has this long quote from somebody who works at YNR. Like, I think it was an actor. It sounded like it was an actor. Um, somebody was kind of quoted anonymously as saying that, like, it's kind of bad behind the scenes. It's a bad environment. It's negative. Nobody's happy with anyone. And I don't know. I wonder if things are going to change. I mean, frankly, a new head writer, I would welcome that. I I don't necessarily think that Jill Farron Phelps and Josh Griff Josh Griffith turned out to be the saviors of YNR that we, they were supposed to be. Do you remember a year ago the show was bad? I mean, it was not in a good place. Uh it wasn't in a great place, but uh 
I don't know. They, they fired um, the, the the last remaining Bell, and they brought on Jill Farron Phelps and Josh Griffith, and, and they were supposed to change everything, and the show was supposed to be phenomenal, and they're, in a lot of ways, it's really not. I love the show, of course. I still love the show, but it does feel, and it seems the consensus, a lot of people are saying this to me, that it just feels like they are so focused on storyline shockers and keeping ratings up so that they can keep their jobs and it's less focused on genuine storytelling, like a desire to really tell a good, meaningful story. I, I just, I think that's true, and I, I really do want to get your opinion on that. I put a poll right on the front page of the website at yrchat.com, and I really want you to go vote in this. Do you think that YNR is in a better place today than it was a year ago? It's a very important question, so go vote yes or no. Feel free to leave me a comment on that, because uh, I, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about what's going on behind the scenes, because there are some times, boy, I got to tell you, where I'm watching the show and I'm like rolling my eyes, or I'm kind of like finding myself doing some other things sometimes. It doesn't feel as like it's drawing me in. It, it, it feels stale, and, not, and to contrast, I have also been watching The Bold and the Beautiful for the past year, and I know Bold and the Beautiful is cheesy, and when I started watching it, I was like, this is a cheesy show, but I'm going to watch it because i got some spare time. But Bold and the Beautiful, in contrast, is actually very good right now. It's rocking my world. It, they have a lot of good dialogue, a lot of really good writing, and even little things. They keep their music. Their music is tight. It's that classic. It's what you kind of come to expect from a soap. And then, um, I just, it was... Such a little thing, but I have to mention this. There was this scene on Bold and the Beautiful where they um, were at an outside restaurant, and you could see the wind blowing in Brooke and Hope's hair, and it just felt like I was there. I felt like I was at that restaurant. And why doesn't YNR do that? It's summer in Genoa City. Why can't they do an outside restaurant scene? That would be cheap to shoot. Like, it just feels like so representative, like there's air blowing through the bold and the beautiful, fresh air blowing through it, and YNR is in these stale, same old, like, oh, I guess it's not old, but they're just inside and cooped up, and I don't know. I, I, there, there's some comparison to be made, and I think there's some improvements to be made, too. So you let me know. May, and I would love to hear from some people that are like, yes, show is way better. Uh, do you think that this show is in a better place than it was one year ago? You've got to leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about that. Also, don't be afraid to get involved in my website. Um, yrchat.com. Those forums are there for you guys to say whatever you want to say, uh, talk about current storylines, past storylines. You can let it all hang out. Tell me exactly what you feel. You can always catch up on the latest videos, podcasts, whatever I'm producing. You will find there at yrchat.com. Um, there's polls you can vote in, games you can play. The Who Said It quote is going to be up there for this week. So go check it out. There's really quite a bit to do. You may catch me online. I tend to be online a little bit more toward the beginning of the week, uh, but you can chat with me right there. There's a live chat box. If I'm online, you can message me and um, tell me what you're thinking about the show. Like I said, I'm usually more online toward the beginning of the week because because toward the end of the week, I start getting spoiler afraid. <laughs> I'm always like, oh, everybody's seen the show. I'm always a little bit behind. I'm at least one or two days behind on the show, and I'm afraid somebody's going <laughs> to spoil me, so I start stealing steering away from the anything YNR toward the end of the week so I don't get spoiled on the Friday cliffhanger. But I am there quite a bit. Uh, you can send private messages. Um, you can mail me anything you want to do right there. I love hearing from you guys, so um, don't be shy. Okay, <laughs> that is just about it for me for this week. I want to say a quick uh, shout out to everybody who's been leaving me voicemails. Uh, Michael, Patricia, Gary, everybody's at the website. Uh, Dylan, uh, Michael's been there quite a bit. And actually, Michael left this really, really good forum post. Um, go to the flashback section and look at uh, his top 10 YNR scenes of all time because it's really good. And there's video of all of the scenes. So, 
if you got some spare time and you want to watch some primo points in YNR history, go to the site and check that out. Um, just thank you everybody for participating. Thank you for your comments and and uh, feel free to leave more. You can ca always call into my voicemail at 309-588-4569. You can leave a comment here on YouTube. Um, you can uh, email me directly at ally at yrchat.com. That's A-L-I at yrchat.com. Um, anything that you want to say, I love to hear it. So um, please feel free. I am getting ready to go on vacation, actually. Uh, I'm going to be here next week, but the following week, I'm not. There's not going to be any YNR chat that following week, which pains me because I'm so afraid that I'm going to end up uh, missing being able to talk about Catherine's funeral. I'm going to watch, of course. Like, I'll be watching all of the shows. <laughs> I just don't know that I'll be able to comment on them. But I, I probably will post some stuff on the website just to, you know, I, I got to get it out at this point. I don't feel good if I don't talk about the show. But, um, yeah, there will be a week where you probably don't, where you definitely won't get a video from me or a podcast. So, there's that. But I'll be back next week for sure. We'll talk again about the show. I love you guys. Have a wonderful week. Mwah. Bye.